here to discuss the future of the American Evangelical Church and his new book, Losing Our Religion. Please welcome Russell Moore, the editor-in-chief of Christianity Today. Leading the conversation is Atlantic staff writer Tim Alberta. Good morning. What a lively audience. Good morning. <laughs> All right. How is everyone? Had our coffee. We're getting there. Good. Um, it's great to be with you, Dr. Moore. Great to be with you. You as well. So much to discuss. Um, I don't want to assume that our audience knows you as well as I do. We've spent a lot of time talking these last few years. I know your story. I think for the benefit of this conversation, it would be very helpful to quickly sort of establish your story so that the context of this is clear and so that everyone can appreciate really what we're describing here. Um, you were, until pretty recently, uh, in charge of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, the public policy arm of the Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the country. And you are no longer in that posting. Uh, and not only that, you are no longer a Southern Baptist, um, which sort of comes with the territory. Um, and you and I have spent a lot of time discussing how your identity growing up was so rooted in being not just any old Christian, but a Southern Baptist. Mm -hmm. And the themes of this book, which I would highly recommend to all of you, are so much around identity, so much around tribe, a word that we're gonna talk about in a minute, but also around what is gained and what is lost in, in the sort of process that you've been through. And I'm wondering first if we can talk about what you've lost and what it meant for you to leave that tribe and what it is ultimately that led you to write the book? Well, the Southern Baptist Convention is essentially the state church of the Bible Belt. And uh, I grew up uh, in, that, uh, in that movement and in, in those congregations. Uh, we had our Southern Baptist version of Boy Scouts teaching us what it meant to be a Southern Baptist. We thought there were other Christians Bless their hearts, they were doing the best they could, <laughs> but we were Southern Baptists. And uh, I was committed to that community, found my, my entire identity uh, bound up in being a, a Southern Baptist. I know all the hymns, I wake up singing the hymns in my mind. Uh, and so walking away from that was very, very difficult for me. But it, it, became, it became necessary at a certain point. When you say that it was very difficult, <clears throat> pardon me, be specific, uh, because you and I have had some, some emotional searching conversations mm -hmm. about this, and I think f for anyone here, whether it's a religious tribe, cultural, family, whatever, if you have experienced that sort of breakage, that sort of rupture, uh, when it comes to something that defines your identity, you understand how painful that can be. Um, Talk to us a little bit about that because it does serve as sort of a thematic undercurrent of the book. Well, I think there's a difference between the way that one processes it cognitively and the way that one processes it subconsciously and at a more psychic level. Uh, being uh, out of one's tribe is viscerally painful, uh, I, I think, for anyone. And for somebody who is out of one's tribe in a religious context, it's very difficult not to feel a sense of judgment as though Jesus himself were saying, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Even if one knows that's not what's going on, it's what it feels like. And that's very difficult to work through. So when I find myself talking to people who are coming out of tribal affiliations that meant everything to them, I mean, often they will say, I feel homeless. And that metaphor, I think, actually is a metaphor of danger. If one is homeless, there is no home to which to return, and, and you're exposed uh, out in the, in the wild. I think that's what many people feel like, no matter what tribe they're, they're coming from. And this returns us to the point of both what is lost and what is gained, because yeah. you talk in the book about how homelessness really is, despite the, the, the inherent or implied danger of homelessness, that homelessness for the Christian is, in fact, to be pursued. Yeah, well, I mean, that's true uh, biblically. It's also true uh, historically. Uh, look at the moments in American life 
when Christianity engaged from a position of influence and strength, prohibition, was a disaster. Look at the moments when Christianity engaged from a, a point of the margins and from a point of weakness. The early Baptist movement uh, in the founding era that led to the First Amendment. The civil rights movement that transformed the entire uh, country. Those things were not coming from a place of power and strength, but from a place of, of uh, cultural weakness, which I think is where Christianity thrives best. I mean, Christianity did not emerge in Mayberry. Christianity emerged in a very hostile uh, Roman Empire and thrived because there's the point of the fundamental strangeness of Christianity where I believe uh, lies its power. And the less cultural, social, political power Christianity has, the healthier the church and the, and the church movement can be, but also the more compelling the message can be to the outside world. Yeah, because if one's seeking a cultural or political power, there is the, uh, th there's the drive to merge into whatever tribe will give that uh, power. And priorities are very quickly lost and an identity is very quickly lost. And I think that's what we've seen, but I think right now there's something new happening where there are opportunities for us to reclaim uh, an identity that we've forgotten. And in your case, you and I, several years ago, uh, almost immediately after you'd officially departed the Southern Baptist Convention, we had a very raw conversation about how the Southern Baptist identity had in fact, in some sense, come to be in conflict with a more fundamental identity. Yeah, I think the Southern Baptist identity had become an idol for me and I needed to be pulled away from it in order to remember what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And um, yeah, that's, that's a painful process, but I think a good one. You and I were talking earlier about this idea that uh, some very, very smart Christians have, have been uh, bandying about in recent years, given all of the turmoil in the church around COVID-19, George Floyd, church closures, 45th president, um, that this could be looked back upon as something of like a 500-year moment for Christianity. And I think, uh, again, sort of implied in that is a negative, that, mm -hmm. that historians will look back on this, this mess that, 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 that we're in now and, uh, and draw some painful conclusions. But there's also a tremendous opportunity if this is, in fact, that sort of 500-year moment for Christianity. Can you talk to me a bit about that? Well, as an evangelical Christian, of course, I believe that uh, crisis uh, leads to a turning point, which can go in, in either direction. And I think this is an altar call moment in many ways for evangelical Christianity and for everybody else to decide uh, where we're going to go. Are we going to be a, a politicized captive uh, to some interest group, or are we actually going to bear witness to something more transcendent than that? And I think if we choose the former, uh, we're going to die. Because if, if people can simply use Christianity as a means to some end, eventually people will ask, well, what is that end and how do I get it without giving up a Sunday morning? Uh, I think Christianity is too important to leave to that. You talk to me about this idea, uh, C.S. Lewis writing about purgatory, yeah. being both incredibly painful, but incredibly necessary. Uh, You've had sort of your own purgatory in the micro, but it feels like we may be living through sort of a macro purgatory as well. Yeah. As a Protestant, I don't believe in purgatory, but I do believe in the Trump era. And uh, I, I, think that, uh, I think that one of the things that has happened is that a lot of the... Um, a lot of the unintentional accretions that we've built around us are being pulled away. And that's, I think, what Lewis uh, meant when he talked about purgation, uh, getting us ready for something else. Uh, but that is not fun in the short term. No, and, and in fact, I could even see you sort of twinge a, min a moment ago when you talked about how being a Southern Baptist had been yeah. a source of idolatry yeah. for you. And so, you know, here's Russell Moore, the, 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 the Protestant Pope, if you will, the, the great hope <laughs> of the Southern Baptist Convention, coming to that very painful realization. And, and, and I wonder um, 
you had joked with me about how your wife had first sort of laid down the gauntlet and said, if you don't leave the Southern Baptist Convention soon, we're going to be in an interfaith marriage, right? right? Um, <laughs> but, but I'm wondering, you know, on that, pa on that path to get to that place, um, was there a, a, a road to demand? <laughs> To, to borrow the laziest metaphor possible, was there a road to Damascus moment, or was this a steady accumulation of, of sort of questioning and, and self-doubt that you had that led you to that realization? Well, there, there was an accumulation. I, I fully expected to have to speak to controversial issues. I didn't expect that saying rape is bad would be controversial in American life. Uh, sedition is bad. Uh, those sorts of questions are, are far away from what I really expected to have to engage with. Uh, but there was a moment when, as somebody who went through a spiritual crisis as a 15 year old, where I had to sort out how much of this is just Bible Belt cultural baggage and how much of it is true. When my 15, then 15 year old son, went to my wife and said, there's constant controversy and investigative committees, just level with me. Has dad like had an affair or something? Uh, and, I said to him, why don't you come with me to the executive committee meeting of our denomination and just sort of hear the grievances that they have against me so that you'll know nobody's holding anything back from you. And he did, sat through it all. We walked out and I said, well, what did you think? And he said, well, I feel great about you, except that I wonder why do we want to be a part of this? <laughs> it was so angry and it was so stupid. And seeing it through his eyes, especially as somebody who is really devoted to passing on the gospel to the next generation, particularly to my children, that was the turning point. And you don't have a great answer to that question. I did not have an answer to that question. <laughs> you know, one of the fundamental schisms that I've discovered in my own reporting uh, and just full disclosure, I've spent a lot of time with Dr. Moore uh, for a book I'm writing sort of somewhat parallel to his about uh, the future of evangelicalism in this country. And one of the real fundamental schisms is a disagreement over this credibility crisis mm -hmm. of the church that you describe in your book, where you have uh, a lot of folks, uh, some of whom are longtime friends, certainly longtime contemporaries of yours, who believe that when you examine these declining trends vis-a-vis uh, -vis church membership, church attendance, self-identification. Um, we are now tracking towards becoming a post-Christian nation at a pretty rapid clip, mm -hmm. uh, which would have been unthinkable, you know, 25, 30 years ago. And, and when you think about that um, sort of, that, that downward trajectory, you have a lot of folks who will say, well, it's because of the forces of secularism. It's, it's because the, the culture has become hostile toward Christianity. I think you and a, and a minority of voices are actually saying, no, 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 the problem here is not the secular world. It is, in fact, the Christian world. That our, credi that our crisis of credibility has, in fact, harmed the witness for Jesus Christ in ways that have become sort of self-perpetuating and driven more people away from the church. Can you talk to me about that? Well, I'm a conservative evangelical, and I think the question is, conserve what? Uh, evangelical is rooted in the, the word for gospel. If we don't conserve the gospel, we have nothing left to give to the outside world. And so when people suggest the stakes are so high that all we need to give up is Christ-likeness and the kingdom of God and our own moral credibility, I just don't believe that. Uh, I, I think that the issue is not just what we're talking about, but the way in which we talk about it. And if we we can't uh, say to the rest of the world, here's how you should follow Jesus. And that's so important that we're going to refuse to follow Jesus to get you there. Yes. I think that's, I think that's insane. This is, this is the George W. Bush, I had to violate free market principles in order to save the free market. Yeah. You have people saying, in order to preserve Christian virtue, I, in fact, need to discard Christian virtue. Yeah, or, or the old uh, billboard in the South by uh, one of the white Citizens Council members, to hell with Christian principles, we've got to save the church. Uh, I reject that. So, <laughs> whew, that, um, <laughs> you have, uh, boy, oh boy, so many places to go with that. Um, <laughs> you know, there was an essay written a, a couple of years ago that I'm sure you saw that described uh, the three historical stages, if you will, of Christianity in America, at least perception-wise. 
this writer made the argument that there was a positive world for Christianity uh, dating back uh, from the early 90s on backward in which there was a positive perception of Christianity and an embrace of Christianity in the culture, and then a neutral world from 1994-ish to maybe 2014-ish, about 20 years in which Christianity was sort of tolerated by the public. And then this writer argued that we are now living in a negative world for Christianity, in which Christianity, there's an active hostility toward Christian uh, beliefs, toward the church in the culture. Um, there are a couple of issues probably with, with, uh, with that argument, namely that if you were um, the Catholic churchgoer in the 50s and 60s whose schools were being shut down by the government, or if you were the black worshiper whose churches were being firebombed, you certainly didn't feel like Christianity was helping you in your social status in society. But I'm wondering whether this, this, this idea, this notion of martyrdom and persecution in the culture uh, poses a greater threat perhaps than many of the folks in this room who, are, who aren't steeped in that subculture realize. Wendell Berry uh, said once, the most dangerous words in the English language are uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. And there's a sense that because there's such an existential threat, all of the old norms have to be tossed aside. That's one thing in the secular world. It's something else when you're talking about not just norms, but commandments that have been given to you by Jesus Christ. So that sense of siege, I think, has lit up the lizard brain in a lot of places in this country uh, that responds with a, a lashing back. Uh, the question is, if we're going to be hated, and Jesus says often we will be hated by the world, the question is hated for what? And there are many of my fellow uh, Christians who believe that we're hated for our commitment to biblical authority, we're hated for our uh, moral superiority, and I don't believe that's the case. I believe often we are hated not for how Christian we are, but for how unchristian we are. And that, I think, is something we have to, we have to reclaim. There's... Um there, there's a professor at Wheaton, an Australian theologian named John Dixon, who uh, said, gave a wonderful presentation I saw a while back when uh, he described those downward trajectories, uh, statistically speaking, about Christianity and public life in America and how the trend lines in Australia are about 10 years ahead. So just about a year, year and a half ago, Australia officially, statistically, became a post-Christian nation. So he was giving this amazing compelling presentation on this, and he said, welcome to the future, my fellow Americans, my fellow Christians. And he talks about how in all of his sociological research, whereas 20 or 30 years ago, the hostility from the culture towards Christians was that was rooted in a belief that they were too self-righteous, too pious, too self-reverent, that in fact now it is not that, but that they are actively wicked, that, that, that Christianity uh, has not just gone through this sort of cultural transformation within the church, but that the external perception of the church has fundamentally changed in these last 10 to 20 years. What can be done about that? Well, that would be bad enough if it were merely external. Uh, when I started in ministry, I would always have young Christians who would come and say, I'm really grappling with my faith. I'm afraid I'm about to lose my faith. In almost all of those cases, it was someone saying, I just can't believe in the supernatural anymore, or I think that the moral requirements of the church are too strict. I almost never hear that now. Instead, I have people who are coming and saying, it's not that I don't believe what the church teaches, I don't believe the church believes what the church teaches. Mm. Now, that's a crisis of credibility, and it's affecting our own uh, children. And, and so I think the, the issue is there has to be a recovery within the church itself uh, of a commitment not to external conformity uh, of the outside culture, but to actual inner transformation that leads to discipleship. I don't want to make America great again. I think we need to make evangelicalism born again. 
And that's the first step to actually bearing witness to something that's more than just political gamesmanship. Now, and you use that, that, that phrase, discipleship. Mm -hmm. You and I speak a yeah. similar language, yeah. but, but some folks here may not. I think it's worth emphasizing that discipling, the verb, discipling, uh, is really, <laughs> we're talking about Jesus and his disciples. Mm -hmm. And Jesus did not infantilize his disciples. He was no. actually quite hard on them. Yes. And there was a, there was a willingness and a necessity of speaking very hard truths and confronting some real problems that weren't always pleasant to confront. Mm -hmm. So that discipleship is not easy. And in fact, there's a real lack of incentive for many church leaders to take on that charge of discipling because their constituents can vote with their feet. Right, right. And there's this temptation, I think it's, it's true in the church and outside of the church. There's this, this temptation to think, I need to conserve my influence because if I'm not here, someone worse than me will be here. And so I need to sort of wait until the moment when I can speak to these things. Problem is there never comes a moment where someone can say, now I can afford to say uncomfortable truths. That moment never comes. And so people can serve their influence all the way through to retirement. And the church suffers and America suffers for that. Uh, I think that what is necessary is both good news and bad news. I mean, that's, that's what evangelical revival meetings are all about. You need to repent, you can be saved. We need to speak to ourselves both the hard truths that's more than just public relations, that it actually costs something to follow Jesus Christ, and the good news to say the church has been through difficult times before, has been revived before, and can be again. And to borrow from a, a, a homily I'd heard from a, a Catholic priest, he was describing how the Old Testament prophets were not so much foretelling the future, mm -hmm. but they were foretelling about the present. That this is what, this is where you've gone wrong. This is where idols have stolen your attention from God. And these are the consequences. You mentioned a moment ago, the sort of generational dynamic at work here yeah. uh, and how for your children, for mine, for the next generation of, of evangelicals, the children of the moral majority, if you will, how they are perhaps the great hope to unlocking this. You had told me a fascinating story a while back about how this illustration of how for so long you'd met with parents for decades who were concerned about the information consumption, the, the, the cultural stuff coming into their kids' brains and, and how it was uh, taking them further and further away from Christ. And now everywhere you go, it's the kids coming to you concerned yeah. about their parents yeah. and their information intake and how it's taking them farther away from Christ. Yes, it's just a complete reversal. What do I do with mom and dad and the things they're watching? Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a strange place to be. The, the good news, I think, is that in almost no case have those young Christians said, help me to win the argument against my parents. Mm. It's, it's always, I love my parents, I really want to connect with them, how can I do it where everything is not an argument about politics and culture wars? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good and positive uh, development. Um, and I think there's a, uh, I had a, a woman who came up to me uh, one time and said, my daughter has gone off to college and she's having, she's having this crisis. And I said, well, what is it? She said, well, she's looking at her non-believing friends and seeing kindness and compassion and love, <laughs> and she's not seeing that in some sectors of the church, and she's trying to explain that theologically. Well, Christian theology actually does have an explanation uh, for that, but one can understand why that would be a crisis. Of course, well, and we're talking, we're back to the Good Samaritan of yeah. the religious leaders refusing to demonstrate the very thing that Jesus in his parable is saying, this Samaritan, this hated enemy of yours, who does not hold to your beliefs, who does not, who does not, was not raised in your traditions, is practicing exactly the love of neighbor yeah. that you are refusing to practice. Well, and it's such a shame because we're at a moment right now where I see people asking those questions uh, more than any time in my lifetime. What does life mean? Is there more to life than this? Uh, I was teaching at the Institute of Politics at the University of Chicago. Almost all of my students were completely non-religious and from completely non-religious backgrounds, and all they wanted to ask about was theology. 
And at one point, there was a student who asked me a, a series of questions, and I was answering them, and he said, now, wait a minute. So you're kind of, um, I don't know if this is offensive, you're kind of a Bible thumper, right? <laughs> and I said, after six years of being accused of being a cultural Marxist, I feel so seen. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I am. Uh, oh. You know, those allegations of cultural Marxism, of being yeah. woke, I mean, these things don't really mean anything anymore, right? No. They're just slurs. Um, but they come from a place of, you write a lot in the book, and you've talked a lot about nostalgia. Yeah. Nostalgia for a bygone era, for an idyllic America, this positive world of Christianity that this writer, that this essayist had described. Um, the problem, as you write uh, in the book, that nostalgia is... In inherently the, the, the enemy of revival, right? That you cannot have both. Yeah. Why? Revival has to be something new, and it means that something old has to collapse. Uh, what nostalgia does is want to go back and retroactively edit the past uh, to make it uh, different and to make it the place to which we, we should return. Uh, I, I will often have Christians who will say, we just... We just need to get this country back to where it was before the culture fell apart. And my response is always to say, you're a Christian. You've never seen the world in which the culture's not fallen apart because the culture fell apart in the Garden of Eden, in our view. <laughs> And so in every era, uh, there is going to be woundedness and sin and death. That's not something that was present in the 1990s or the 1950s or the uh, 1770s or wherever someone wants to return. And to your point earlier, the Bible is written from the perspective of the underdog. Yeah. The, 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 the Jewish slaves in Egypt and the Christians living under Roman occupation. So how do we in the bosom of the American empire, if you will, return to and embrace that sort of marginal countercultural Christianity that has produced some of the healthiest moments in the history of the church. Well, Jesus said to one of his disciples, uh, Peter, you will be led where you do not want to go. And I think uh, right now it may be that circumstances are, are taking us where we do not want to go, not our own uh, will and volition and, and conviction. And so there is a, a place after the sacrifice of the credibility uh, of the Christian church where a, a new generation of Christians must speak. And they, they're speaking in a very different uh, setting. I mean, there, there was a, a politician who said to me one time, thinking about running for president in the future, and said, can you give me uh, some good, growing, young evangelical churches in Iowa and South Carolina for me to know about? And I said, I can do that, but none of them will have you speak. None of them will give you their church directory. That is not the way that they operate. They, they think in very different terms. I think that is happening right now. And for people who are accustomed to evangelical Christians uh, being sort of cicadas that go into dormancy in between Iowa caucuses, uh, that's a very different reality. Hmm. Uh, indeed. Um, boy, the metaphors here are just... <laughs> So let me close by asking you this, Dr. Moore. Um, again, you have gone through a pretty remarkable journey here and a painful journey. And, and you and I have had uh, some, some emotional, uh, very hard conversations about what you have lost. Um, dear friends, people who, you told me at one point that your, what you had once planned to be your funeral program with who would have spoken had to be ripped up because a lot of those people are just not in your life anymore. It's an incredibly painful thing. But I'm wondering, in all of that loss, what has been gained for you and what might be gained for those listening who have experienced a similar journey? Well, I think that there are, there's a shifting happening right now. And there are a lot of old alliances and coalitions that have been ripped apart. But there are new alliances and coalitions forming of people who are realizing, wait, I never knew that we actually were in agreement and we agree on much more than I, than I think. I think you see that happening in the secular political world. 
in which uh, people are saying to one another, we can argue about all of these things, uh, but we have to have a democracy in order to argue about that. And I think you're seeing people in the church who thought, we thought we were in different tribes and different worlds, but we're actually together on what really matters. Mm. And I think that's where it starts. In our 30 seconds or so remaining, I'm going to offer you that rarest of opportunities in Washington, D.C., an open-ended invitation to proselytize. What, what, what is it for the person in this audience? Because you are an evangelical, and believe it or not, the idea there is to evangelize. Right. So if you were to speak to the person in the audience who is searching, as you described a minute ago, where do they start and what do you say to them? Uh, I would say just spend some time reading the Gospel of John and consider this figure of Jesus and uh, realize that he never idealized uh, the church. He never idealized Christianity. He said, come and see. And when you see this figure and you listen to this uh, figure, um, I think you might find that's worth uh, giving everything up for. Dr. Moore, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for listening.